the peace of Christ be with you. Welcome to our time together today of shared worship. You will notice, I would imagine, that this is not the sanctuary where we usually gather. Instead, as you have been practicing worship from home, now I join you in that practice. It is part of um, a practical witness of what it means to stay home and stay healthy, but I can't help but think about how it's also something that connects us with a rich tradition that has shaped us as people of faith across the generations. We know that worship in homes was part and essential to the Christian movement in the same way that John Wesley, when he came with his revivalist movement, he too emphasized the gathering in homes, the making sure that our studies, our prayers, our worship happened in the very places we lived. These practices have been so essential in shaping people of faith and so today, though we share them perhaps in a way unexpected for us, in a new way, let us do so knowing that we are still part of a rich tradition of practicing worship at home, and yet still together. And so, my dear friends, may Christ bind us together in every space, with every space between us filling that distance that we would know that we are full of the love of God, the love of each other, and surrounded by a community that has shaped us for generations. Let us be in a spirit of prayer. God, who is both ancient and yet somehow ever new, we give thanks for your presence that holds us today, for your spirit that longs to fill every space between us. Let us rest in your embrace and remember that we are bound together by your peace. For then we will truly be people of faith practicing an ancient tradition in a new age. Through Christ and with the power of the Spirit we pray. Amen. My friends, I don't know about you, but these last few days I sometimes have found myself wondering what day it is. Apart from my rhythm and routine, I wake up and I have to remind myself where we are in the week. And so I want to invite you to remember where we are in our Lenten season. We are coming up on the end of it. In two weeks, we'll worship in a way like this and celebrate the resurrection of Easter. Next week, we hear Palm Sunday that leads us into Holy Week. And so, as we come to the end of Lent, we hear two stories today that are familiar ones to us, that we always read at this time. It's the story of Ezekiel and the Valley of the Dry Bones, and the story of Jesus when he raises Lazarus to life anew. These stories foretell for us what we will hear in the weeks ahead. We hear both of the reality of death the one that Christ himself will experience on the cross. And we hear also in these stories the promise of life anew that God has on the other side, that we await in resurrection. So I invite you to hear these stories today. Our first one comes from Ezekiel chapter 37. Hear this story of the valley of the dry bones. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. 
Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound. And the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophecy to the breath, prophesy son of man and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I entered, so I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture this morning tells the story of Jesus when he raises Lazarus to new life. Hear now this reading as John tells it in chapter 11. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped him his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Jesus delayed in coming and on his arrival found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem and so many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them and their loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, and Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. And after she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had seen who, when the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? And Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor. He has been there for four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? 
So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. My friends, this is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. As I've been reading these stories this week, I find myself just wanting to ask what happens next in them? What happens when Lazarus releases the grave clothes and is set free, unbound? What is that new life like for him? And maybe I also wonder, was he ready for it? I ask the same thing of that valley of the dry bones. When breath fills them anew and they were stood on their feet, what was that new life like for them? Were they ready for it? Ready for whatever journey lay ahead where their new body would take them? As you see, I can't help but think that something must have been completely, totally, 100% different, new, transformed. There is no possible way that I will ever believe that they just went back to life as usual. I don't even know that I could believe that there's anything you could call usual after these stories. Stories where God, miraculous, prophetic, overcomes death. That thing that never fails, that has now failed? Death, that thing that comes for us all, that God has now come for? I don't believe that there was just going back to life as it was before when the grave clothes came off. When that breath of new life coursed through them, I refuse to believe it. I refuse to believe that they just yawned and stretched and shook off the dust, threw off the grave clothes, and went back to what was, as if it was nothing more than a long nap. As if it was though their life was only on pause and God had hit play again. I refuse to believe that's what it was. For this is life anew. This must be total, utter transformation. Not just a continuation of what was, not just a continuation of the same. And so I find myself curious. What was that new life like for them? Maybe just as curious, were they ready for it? Were they willing to participate in it? to go where that new breath led. We know Lazarus was completely, entirely transformed. What we know of his story, which isn't actually all that much, not that John tells us, what we know though, is that when he came out of the tomb, when the grave clothes came off, people heard the story and they flocked to see him. They took one look at him standing there alive and well, and they believed in Jesus because of it. Was Lazarus ready when he came out of that tomb for his entire life, his very existence, to become a testimony, a witness to what God can do through Jesus? Was he ready for what it meant for his whole being? to tell the power of Christ alive in the world? Was he ready for that kind of transformation? 
Did he maybe, just maybe, remember and miss that old, familiar, quiet, small life he had? My friends, these are questions that Lent asks us to think about prayerfully, to consider what new life means, what transformation means, and perhaps more importantly, if we are really ready for it, if we are really willing to go and step into that new life, to breathe deep of the Spirit. And so these questions of were they really ready, what was it like? They weigh on me right now. And truth is, they weigh on me a little more in this season than in any other Lenten season yet. Because I don't have to tell you that a lot of us feel like our lives are a bit on pause, different now. I don't have to tell you that it is tempting for grave clothes of fear and isolation and loneliness and uncertainty and self-sufficiency to be wrapping themselves around us in this season. And so I wonder, more so in these days than any other, am I really ready to believe transformation, to, ber to believe life anew? to believe Spirit of God coursing through me, through you, alive in the world that transforms in ways I can't even begin to imagine. What will that new life be like? Am I ready for it, willing to step into it? The truth is, sometimes, in these days, the fear, the unknowing, the isolation, the everything being new, different, thrown off. There have been days when I have not wanted to think about transformation, new life. I have not wanted to even begin to imagine that God is yet renewing, redeeming this time. Though I hope that that is true. Sometimes it's been too much for me to wrap my head around. And so I thought that I would get a little break from thinking about it when Sasha came to me and requested that I read her a story. I gladly said yes, a break from thinking about these big questions of faith, of life. And then she came to me with this book, Mike Mulligan and His Steam Shovel. This is a book that was Kevin's favorite as a kid. Sasha now loves it and asks for it over and over and over and over. And because we're home a lot more over and over and over again. So I know it quite well. I thought I would get a break from these questions of new life and transformation until she brought me this book and asked me to read it. Because this is a story very much of transformation. In the story, it tells Mike Mulligan, who has a beloved steam shovel named Marianne. They do great, wonderful things together. They build canals and highways, and then things change. In this case, what happens is technology changes. Along come gas and diesel and electric shovels, new ways to do this work. And so it tells that the steam shovels were coming to their end. In fact, there's a page in this book that reminds me of the Valley of Dry Bones. It is steam shovel upon steam shovel, worn out and discarded in a heap. And yet Mike refuses that for Marianne. Mike wants something more for that than that for Marianne. So he goes to a new place, to a new project. They are going to build a cellar and a town hall. And so they go to this place and they do their work and they dig. And in the end of it, they have forgotten to leave a way out. There is no way out of their circumstances. So the people, they gather and they wonder, what are they to do about this, this problem? And then a little boy comes along with a great idea. He says, why don't we just leave that steam shovel Marianne in there? Let her stay in the cellar. 
Except he doesn't mean let her stay in the cellar, old, worn out, discarded, forgotten. No, the little boy has a different idea. Why not make her the furnace, he says. Then she can heat up the whole entire building. Mike, he can become the janitor in the town hall. And so it is. So it is, the story goes that if you happen upon this little town of Popperville, and you go into the town hall, you go into the basement, there Marianne will be, heating up that building still, giving it life anew. There Mike will be beside her, the janitor. My friends, I have no idea whether this is a realistic ending to this book. I have no idea if a steam shovel could be transformed to become a furnace. But what I do know is that transformation, miracles, they are not dependent on being what we think of as realistic, what we think of as possible. Transformation, miracles are about the work of God that sees a possibility of new life that we cannot even fathom yet. Where we see only the holes that we have dug ourselves in, God sees the possibility of what we can be, what our creation can be. I thought I would get a break from the questions of transformation and new life when Sasha came and requested a book until it was this one. And I was left to wonder, I wonder if Mike and Mary Ann were ready for the transformation. They said yes to it. I wonder though, if when they started in this project, if they were just hoping to hold on to their old life as long as possible. And then something new, new life came of it instead. I wonder if Lazarus, when he stepped out of that tomb and threw off the grave clothes, if he was surprised life didn't go back to normal. Transformation that his whole entire life would now be a witness to the power of God through Jesus. I wonder those valley of dry bones when they stood on their feet and breath filled them if they quickly looked for their familiar places to return. Though God invited them somewhere new to be faithful people in another way. My friends, there is no escaping questions of transformation, of new life. The question that we ask is, are we ready? Or if not ready, at least willing to trust, to see, to throw off the grave clothes, to breathe deep of the spirit, and take a step out of whatever tomb surrounds us. Because the truth is, my friends, what we believe what we know is that Christ is already standing there calling to each of us, come out and live. What we know is true is that Ezekiel's prophecy already takes its voice in the living spirit of God that is released and alive in the world that will come from the four corners of creation to fill us with life and breath again and again and again every time we dare to receive it. Are we willing? Are we ready to be transformed into something new? Or are we simply hoping we can be people of faith who end this Lenten journey with a little more stamina for life as we've always known it? God is inviting us into something new in ways that we perhaps cannot imagine, in ways that in this season of all seasons, we maybe can't imagine, in ways that are maybe even too overwhelming for us to consider when it feels like fear, death, isolation, and loneliness, and self-sufficiency are wrapping themselves tighter around us. 
my friends, Jesus is there calling, come out, live, release the grave clothes, be set free. Into something we may not yet even imagine, but trust to be full of promise, of new life, with God, with each other, with the kingdom come that is not of this world, but a kingdom come that surely is. So my friends, my prayer for us today is that God would make us ready to release the grave clothes, to deep, breathe deep of the spirit coursing through us. My prayer is God would make us ready for what new life God is fashioning for us, calling us into. My prayer, too, is that when the truthful answer is we are not ready, we are not willing. That God would keep walking beside us, calling to us, breathing into us anew, filling us with peace when only fear confines us. My dear friends, may we see what new life God is offering. Amen. My friends, we come to the time where we offer ourselves. It's a time when we would normally offer our gifts, and I would encourage you to continue to offer yours and remember the church, remember the mission that we are about. Remember ways that you can give online or mail your check even as we come to a time when we celebrate the ways in which we are still community with one another. For in our prayers of the people, we remember the ways we are still community together, people in prayer and faith together. And so today, let us use the refrains we know and the one I introduced last week, Lord and your mercy, we reply here our prayer, and Lord full of grace, we respond, we give you thanks. Receive these and be in a spirit of prayer as I raise these, the prayers of the community that have come before me this week. First, a word of praise that we have rejoiced in already for Nancy Lombard on the healthy birth of another granddaughter named Callan and for good test results for her daughter-in-law, Trish. Lord, full of grace, we give you thanks. I offer a praise knowing this list is not exhaustive, but this week I saw Jess Jarris bringing Christmas lights in her yard to bring joy to neighbors. I saw Cherry Brown creating masks, sewing to share her gifts with others in need to help a need she saw. There are garden beds in God's garden and they are full of dirt ready for when planting will come. I give thanks for all the ways that I continue to see us sharing gifts generously to meet needs in the community. Lord, full of grace, we give you thanks. Prayer request from Michael Johnson for his mother who has a severe upper respiratory infection that is unrelated to the virus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. A prayer that Sindel Davis lifts up for those who are pregnant and cut off from their support system for those who may face labor alone in the transition to parenthood on their own. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. A prayer for all who are overwhelmed and just getting by right now. For those who say we are not ready for what is new yet, but who still hope that maybe one day we will be. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us continue in a spirit of prayer. Lord God, we breathe deep of your spirit, trusting that it is alive at work, creating, coursing through us, coming from the four corners of creation to remake us after your way. We know that that transformation is not just to life as we have always known it, but is to life anew as we can hardly 
imagine it, full of promise, full of hope, full of new community, full of justice, full of mercy and compassion and love outpoured and healing for broken hearts and broken lives. Lord God, you who are in every breath, in every space, in the intimacy of our homes, in the four corners of a world far away that we hardly see. Lord, we give thanks that you are always with us. That means that you can be with us in our many different circumstances. For those who are overwhelmed in this season, for those who fear burnout as they try and still do all the things, work, parent, homeschool, now all from home, we remember, too, that there are some out of work and that there are too many out of work who rely upon the income that comes from work. We remember the strain of that injustice. Lord, we remember there are some who are alone, lonely, isolated, feeling forgotten, discarded, perhaps. Lord, we know you remember us. Help us to do what we can to remember each other, too. At the same time, we remember there are others whose circumstances means that they are not alone. They grow weary from sharing space with someone. For too many, sharing space with someone who is not safe. Lord, we lift up to you the reality. Domestic violence and abuse and child abuse are already being seen on the rise in the weeks of this virus. Lord, we pray your protection, we pray your peace, we pray your healing upon us. We hope still in the new thing that you are creating, the new life you invite us into, that you will create. We pray it in the hope of Jesus who taught us what it is to pray together, remembering that we are lifting our many voices as we have been bound together in heart, we raise our voices as one this time praying as Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, I would leave you with an invitation. There's a video I shared with you of a closing song, Breathe On Me, Breath of God. Hum it, sing it, watch the video. Let it seep into you till the breath of God fills you anew. My friends, now receive this blessing as we go. It is one that comes from another song or is adapted from it. My friends, may the spirit of the living God fall afresh on you this day. May it make you and remake you after God's way. May it fill you with God's peace when fear and overwhelm would confine you. May we go in the peace of Christ and may God be with us until we meet again. Amen.